Hi, my name is Science with Chris, and this week I'm on my night's rotation for OBGYN for AIs. And I kind of wanted to spend a little bit of a moment every single day to kind of talk about something new that I learned or a way that I can better chart or note for patients. So to kick it right off, this previous night was my first night and I met all of my new team and they were pretty awesome. And the one thing I learned was when a patient comes in and they have comorbid condition of diabetes or a patient at type one, uh, you definitely need to know what their regimen is, like how much Lantus or Novolog they're getting. Um, you need to know who they're being followed by. So if it's going to be a certain group or a certain physician, you need to know that. And then usually onset of diagnosis. Um, this will be like the full extent of their diabetes care. And then the last thing you want to know is if they had any um, uh, complications from it. So if they've had DKA, if they've had any seizures, hypoglycemic events, passing out, any retinopathy, um, any neuropathy. So kind of having that full extent, that's a good way to kind of say, okay, this person has type 1 diabetes, poorly controlled on finger six pound two hundreds, managed with this insulin and whatever, um, with care by endocrine group. And then if they ask you, you say, okay, there was no DKA events noted, the person did not ex experience any seizures or um, like syncope from uh, hypoglycemic events. So that was what I learned today. So let's see what I learned tomorrow. So this is gonna be night number three coming up for me tonight. So last night, what I looked at was the comparison between Cervidil and Cytotec. Cervidil is dinoprostone, Cytotec is mesoprostol. And I wanted to compare their efficacy and cervical ripening in patients, um, specifically for patients who are about to go into like IOL, induction of labor. And what I was able to find was that there was no, no, neither of them was less risky than the other. So they both had the same safety profile, but people who took Cytotec were more likely to, to deliver in 24 to 48 hours, and they were less likely to use oxytocin compared to people who were using Cervidil. The second thing as well, uh, Cervidil costs $168 while Cytotec only costs two. So from a utilitarian standpoint, it is more beneficial to use um, Cytotec for two reasons. One, it has same efficacy at same safety profile, but increased efficacy. And number two, it actually costs less. So you're saving money while getting better results. So those are the two comparisons that I looked at for um, cervical ripening. So this is my fifth night coming up right now. And the thing I learned last night was that when you are initially putting in an epidural into a patient for pain management for delivery, you first inject lidocaine and epinephrine. The epinephrine is so that if you do inject into a venous structure, that you will be able to tell if there is tachycardia a lot quicker. Now that was like the one fast fact that I want to tell you. Okay, so now it's Friday. I finished my last night shift this morning. And the thing I learned last night, um, a patient came on the floor um, for elective induction of labor at 39 weeks for fetus that had TOF, tetralogy of flow. And so I just read a little bit of paper about that so I could kind of understand it. So this would be a little bit longer, but so tetralogy of flow, so some of the facts for epidemiology. So there's 1,600 new patients each year that have TOF, and it's roughly a one in 2,500 birth rate. So really roughly one in every 2,500 births are gonna have tetralogy of flow. Um, there's a spectrum of disease. The most severe form of TOF has pulmonary atresia hyphen VSD. Sometimes it's uh, annotated as pulmonary atresia VSD. Um, some things I learned as well, so aside from like with the tet spells, when you put the knees up to the shoulders or like the abdomen, you can actually give uh, IV phenylephrine. The phenylephrine is, does two things. One, it increases SVR so that you're able to put more blood back up to your, to your central circulatory system. And the second thing as well is that it decreases um, the uh, restriction in the lungs, so it actually increases pulmonary circulation. Uh, the other thing that you can give as well is esmolol. Esmolol in babies is beneficial to patients with TOF because it decreases cardiac contractility. So it actually works, makes the heart 
work better in the sense that it's able to fill more. So that was my little presentation on TOF. Uh, you have to know if it's ductile dependent or not, so make sure that you're writing that in your notes. And if it's ductile dependent, then really should be like NICU and PEDS cards should be on board because the patient usually probably gonna go for some prostaglandins immediately after delivery, and they might need to do some cardiac catheterization in order to better visualize the degree and extent of pulmonary atresia. And that was my night float for this week. I hope it was inter entertaining and interesting and educational about the little things that I learned throughout this week. So thanks for tuning in, I'll see you soon.